you all for being here tonight. Um, as John uh, noticed, this is just the start of, uh, of what I hope to be a rich conversation um, tonight and throughout the day tomorrow on um, the topic of <clears throat> the emerging call. Um, and I'll say a little bit in, in just a second about uh, kind of our thinking about the conference as a whole. Um, but I want to just begin with uh, <clears throat> that conference theme, the emerging call. One of the things that I've noticed in some of the research I've been doing lately on call, uh, vocation in general is that I've noticed that the concept of call or vocation very often is an empty category. Right? You can do a keyword search um, or Google uh, vocation or call. And uh, if you're doing searching in any kind of uh, theological or church sort of database, you get all kinds of entries on everything. The vocation of the theologian, the call to marriage, the priestly calling, the call to discipleship, the call to lay ecclesial ministry. And, and none of those articles is actually about call or vocation, right? They're all about theologians or marriage or priesthood or lay ecclesial ministry. And so my thought for tonight uh, since this is a conversation on the emergent call, and, 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 and John and Marty and others and I kind of sort of decided that it might be best to spend a few minutes at least reflecting on call itself, on the notion of vocation. And I want to use that word in its broadest, most inclusive sense to talk about what is for Christians the basic call, the call to discipleship. And that, I think, kind of introduces sort of the plan, the rough plan uh, of the conference, which is tonight focus most broadly on this basic call, this universal call to holiness, call to discipleship. Reflect a little bit about that. I have some remarks I will make. I hope not to talk too long. And then we'll have plenty of time tonight for conversations, for your questions, for me, for conversations among one, one another. So I hope this kind of starts us off. And then we'll, as we'll move through the day, um, tomorrow, we'll, <clears throat> taking that as our base, we'll reflect on that discipleship as it's lived out in our changing parishes and in the changing forms of ministry and, and end the day, day tomorrow by reflecting more particularly on um, our call, the call in the church to ministry and the ways in which that ministry serves discipleship. That's sort of the plan. Does that sound... Okay, let's start that. If it doesn't, talk to John and <laughs> with an alternative. I'm going to talk tonight about call, the call to discipleship. Uh, John mentioned, I grew, uh, or Melinda actually, grew up in northern Michigan. Growing up in Lake Leona, Michigan, um, as a Catholic, I heard the word vocation quite a bit. Okay? And it always meant one thing, right? The call to be a priest, okay? and for the girls to be a nun, maybe. But it really meant a call to be a priest. There was a kind of a secondary uh, sense in which we used the word, which I always sort of associated with those guys in the black t-shirts who left our high school uh, every afternoon and went to the local community college to take classes in computer-aided drafting and electronics repair, because we called them, in the, they were in the vocational program, <laughs> or voc ed. But to me, that was always an odd use of the word. It didn't really make much sense to me, for, because really, vocation meant entering the seminary or joining the convent. Tonight, I want to talk about, obviously, call in a much broader sense. And I hope to, to do three things tonight before we open it up to a larger conversation. I want to say something about, first of all, why talk about vocation? Why focus in on that? Well, what's the value? What's the need? What's, how does that help? Secondly, then, look at um, our tradition and talk a little bit about the history of our understanding of vocation, what we might learn from that, a uh, way in which that theological category has been used, and then finally make some only very initial uh, suggestions about ways we might think about reclaiming a more personally meaningful and pastorally relevant theology of call. Does that sound okay? Okay. Good, because you'd have to take that up with me, and I'm, I'm in the middle of something here right now. So. Um, okay, so first of all, why? I want to emphasize vocation in its broad sense, the call to discipleship. I want to try and work, and I, I, I've dedicated some time thinking about this, because I think that that notion of call speaks in a particularly powerful way to what? The question of the meaning of life. And I think it offers a rich alternative and way of coming at that question, a rich alternative to what is, I think, our contemporary cultural default, namely choice. 
choice, the notion of choice, has become one of our most important ways of framing reality, a lens on all aspects of our lives. So present, we don't even acknowledge it or recognize it, shaping almost everything we do, including the way in which we think about our religious experience and the religious aspect dimension of our existence. Okay? Choice has come to even influence how we talk about our faith. This is a relatively recent phenomenon. In an earlier era, you could say that religion was something that you were born into, something inherited. You were socialized into a group and found your religious identity as part of this group, and there are all kinds of mechanisms of the group uh, that were at play and at work in order to encourage conformity to this, that particular religious identity, including, most importantly, the idea that you better do this or you're going to go to hell, which is always a powerful motivating <laughs> mechanism. Well, things have shifted markedly in the last 50 or 100 years, right? Context, group identity hasn't disappeared, but I would argue that's no longer the model of custom or command that dominates, but that of choice. The sociologist of, Amer of American religious, uh, re religion, Robert Wuthno, talks about the shift from religious dwelling to spiritual seeking. That's way of his, his way of kind of naming this shift, from dwelling to seeking. And he argues that you know, before, folks were first members of a religious community, and that community or that tradition gave meaning to an individual's life. They dwelled within it. Now, folks feel that they have to build their own personal synthesis. Right? We're quite comfortable drawing on various religious traditions to do so, but ultimately it all is about how I'm going to use these traditions in my life. We're spiritual seekers. <clears throat> on the one hand, you could say in the old days, beliefs held believers. Right? Today, believers hold beliefs. Okay? And, the, and with no acknowledges, I agree that the, these are broad generalizations, but I think he taps into something uh, important and an important shift that we've gone through, right? Rather than rest secure in the womb of organized religion, today we launch out on our own. We are on a quest. That's another powerful metaphor that's used to describe this uh, uh, contemporary religious experience, the quest. Spirituality as a project, a journey for the individual, one in which we are on a search for bits of wisdom and insight to craft a coherent, framework for life. Faith is not something given, but something for which to strive. Authenticity replaces authority. Wholeness becomes the measure of holiness. This is what sociologists, anyway, mean when they talk about the quest. Now, the individualism inherent in this model, and frankly, the superficiality of so much that confronts us in self-help guides and popular spirituality, all of that makes this whole paradigm of the quest and of choice a pretty easy target. Critics c uh, uh, would uh, critique it for um, promoting a trivial, privatized, self-absorbed spirituality. And I think that there's a lot of that critique is right on. But I also think that it's a mistake to judge this paradigm of choice by its most shallow and stupid forms, right? Because I think it can overlook a deeper cultural dynamic that we're living through. I think it also can underestimate the motivation of many spiritual seekers for whom the quest doesn't end in self-improvement, but extends outward into altruistic behavior, community participation, service to others, and so on. So it's a bit more complex. There are positives of choice, right? Choice in our religious lives, our spiritual lives, promotes agency and intentionality. It moves us beyond blind acceptance and passive membership. It stresses the importance of the personal relationship with God. I think it's good to acknowledge the gains that come with choice. And yet, there's just something so darn uninspiring about it. I get to pick, right? That's the paradigm of choice. And there's a deeper problem, I think. I think that one of the biggest limitations of choice as an overarching framework for the spiritual life is the way in which it can short circuit personal transformation. Right? If religious traditions or religious institutions or religious beliefs no longer provide the context 
for the spiritual life, but are simply resources for our own spiritual constructions, can they ever really challenge us? Can they really challenge us to grow? Or is this just something that I get to include in my life, a life whose basic orientation and pattern is already well established before any real encounter with the demands of the gospel? Okay. So I, I kind of want to just begin by kind of naming that as what I think one of the dominant ways in which religious experience is shaped today. Not too quickly writing it off, acknowledging some of its limitations, trying to call for um, a more nuanced engagement and alternative ways of articulating the concerns of the contemporary spiritual seeker. All of this is trying to explain the context and, and, and the reason which I think vocation or call emerges as a particularly rich resource. Okay? I think it's precisely because of this need for a more nuanced engagement with our contemporary, contemporary spiritual kind of context. Precisely because of that, I think, this is where the language of vocation helps. Because the language of call or vocation taps into the deep-seated sensibilities of the quest. Right? Integrity, identity, itinerary but in a way that resists self-absorption. Okay? It acknowledges the importance call does, vocation does, that metaphor, that way of thinking. Acknowledges the importance of discernment and decisions, which are the virtues of choice, but it recognizes that our decision comes as a response to something, to someone beyond. Right? Within the paradigm of call, we see that the world doesn't start with us. Christians, believers, believe that it starts with God. In other words, our freedom doesn't hover supreme over an infinite number of options. That's the basic paradigm of choice, right? Our freedom rather stands under the transcendent, okay? Always being drawn up and out into the source of our being. That, to me, is the basic pattern of call, okay? My vocation, in other words, is quite simply then the way that I will rise, okay? Yet, like picking a point on the dome of the sky, there are an infinite number of ways up. Okay? What will be my unique way of responding? What will be my, the, the, the transcendent trajectory of my life? Call, vocation, I think, has tremendous potential for speaking to believers today. That's why I'm talking about it tonight. Okay? All of this presupposes a broad and inclusive notion of call. It's a bigger vision. Um, than that rather narrow interpretation, those narrow understandings that I grew up with, the ones that restrict vocation to religious life or reduce it to a job. Okay? So I want to say a little bit about that, and I'll turn to part two. Okay? To, look a little, to say a little bit about what has, what, what's the history here, what, the, the context within which we talk about vocation in this broader sense, the, the call to discipleship, the call to holiness, as Vatican II says, that uh, is really the, the, the fundamental context and the goal of all ministry, right? If we lose sight of discipleship, why are we talking about ministry, right? How do we talk, how, how does ministry serve that basic <clears throat> call of discipleship? Let me offer a little bit of history, okay? I, I always want to kind of warn people when, they, when you invite um, professor of theology to give a talk, it's very dangerous because you'll never quite know if you're going to get lectured to or preached at. Um, so this is my lecturing sort of begins. A little bit of history. Okay? The Bible uses the word call, in Greek it's klesis, a lot. And it usually refers to one or two things. Okay? When you sort of eliminate um, all the kind of ordinary everyday ways in which the word is used. When it's used in a more religious sense, vocation or call klesis refers to either the call to faith on the one hand, or the call to do a special task on behalf of God. So, in the Hebrew Bible, God calls the people Israel, okay? But God also calls individual prophets to do particular things on behalf of God, okay? In the New Testament, Jesus calls all of his listeners to new life. He also calls individual disciples to follow him in very concrete ways. So, from the very beginning of Christianity, even before that, there's a tension surrounding this notion in religiousness between the few and the many. It goes all the way back to the beginning. Very quickly, in the early church, okay, in the face of a pagan culture and periodic persecution, vocation was all about call, klesis, was all about the call to be Christian, 
that first broad understanding, right? Should I be a Christian? That was the big vocational question for those first few followers of Jesus. And if so, how public should I be about it? Okay, in the face of the, the very real burdens and sometimes persecution that that would uh, uh, mean. But after the conversion of the Emperor Constantine in the fourth century and the gradual recognition, the recognition and gradual uh, 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 affirmation of Christianity as the official religion of the Roman Empire, it was no longer such a big deal to be a follower of Christ, right? In fact, everybody was doing it. Um, and as Christianity became less special, we see the rise of a new reality within Christianity, monasticism. Okay? This, by the way, is a broad and sweeping generalization. Monasticism, which was at least in part a reaction to the too easy accommodation of Christianity to its surrounding culture. The few. Okay? Over the course of the early Middle Ages, a special class of Christians takes shape, right? Those who are de dedicated to a higher life, who commit, commit their lives totally to the things of God. We, we, we start to see um, um, a, a kind of a, a splitting, right? Between laity and clergy on one hand, and the layperson and the monk on the other. This kind of gradual growing divide. And you start to see a migration of terms um, conversion, the word conversion no longer applies primarily to that turning from the world to follow Christ that it had at the very beginning. Conversion meant the turning to leave the world in order to enter into the monastery. Likewise for vocation, less and less did it apply to the broader call to be a follower of Jesus. More and more it meant that call to enter into a particular state of life, namely monasticism. We see this kind of split. So much so that by the 12th century, the very influential canon lawyer Gratian will speak quite easily of two kinds of Christians, right? the clergy and everybody else. Okay? <laughs> the word vocation means less the call to faith than the call to enter into that special state of life. To have a vocation meant what it meant for me as a kid, right? to be called to be a priest or religious. Okay? Continuing my broad, sweeping generalizations, in many ways, the Reformation, the Protestant Reformation, can be read as a wide-ranging rejection of this two-tiered Christianity, okay? part of larger reformer movements, reforming movements going back to the Middle Ages. Um, and in some ways, I kind of haven't thought much about this, but I'll throw it out there. In some ways, I think you could read the whole second century, or the second millennium of Christian history as, a, as, as, as basically an attempt to overcome two-tiered Christianity, right? The experts and everybody else. Martin Luther rejected the hierarchical priesthood of the ordained and instead recovered that biblical image, the priesthood of all believers, reclaiming that notion of our common baptismal dignity, okay? Luther saw priesthood, right, which had become one, of, again, kind of confined or restricted to the ordained in, its, in a broader way, right? Drawing on scripture, scripture's use of that category. And he also saw vocation as a broader category. And in the process, Martin Luther creates a genuinely new understanding of vocation, okay? Introduces a quite radical shift in the way in which Christian Europe was using that word, okay? Remember I said a few minutes ago in the New Testament, the concept of call is used in basically one of two ways. It's the call to faith or the call to a specific religious task on behalf of God. Well, Luther introduces a third meaning of vocation, and he launches a new trajectory uh, in part in, on his, in his commentary on 1 Corinthians 7.20. Okay? In that passage, St. Paul is, in the context of one of his typical exhortations, right, tells his listeners to, quote, remain in the calling in which you were called. Remain in the calling in which you were called. What Luther does with that is that he takes that word calling, klesis in the Greek, and translates it with the German word beruf, B-E-R-U-F, okay? Interpreting it as one's occupation or state in life, okay? And reads Paul as saying, remain in the occupation or the state or the stand is, is, is his word, the, the, the state in which you were called, okay? And he uses that then to argue that it's not just the monks, okay, who have a calling from God or have a vocation. Rather, 
every state of life, remain in the state of life in which you are in. Every state of life, every type of work can be seen as a calling, a true vocation. There's a radical kind of democratization of the word vocation in Luther, right? Why, Luther says, why? Because it's precisely there in the state of life that you're in, in the type of work that you're in, that we serve God by serving others. And he goes on to argue that it's dangerous to think, actually, that only the monks, only the nuns, only the priests have a vocation, that only they have a calling, that only their lives are holy. Okay? It's part of his larger kind of anti-monastic polemic, uh, his, his, his argument against the abuses of the monastery, which for Luther then becomes, I think, a, a somewhat a critique of all monastic life. Um, uh, he, he wants to say that that medieval assumption is wrong. It's wrong to think that true holiness is found only in withdrawal from the world, in abstinence, in celibacy. And he turns that whole kind of mentality on its head when he argues that, you know, actually, Luther says, to join religious life or to enter into the priesthood is to flee from that particular place of responsibility in which God calls you. Does that make sense? Right? That monks claim to be following the more difficult path. But the real challenge, according to Luther, the most demanding calling is not escaping the world, but living in it. Okay? Celibacy is not the real cross for Luther. Marriage is. Right? That's what he wants to say. And he goes on in a wonderful passage, right? kind of expounding on this point. He tells the story of a young man he knew who's contemplating getting married. And this young guy looks around at all his married friends. And then he asks himself, and I'll quote Luther, right? This young man asks himself, Alas, must I rock the baby, wash its diapers, make its bed smell its stench, stay up nights with it, take care of it when it cries, heal its rashes and sores, and on top of that, care for my wife, provide for her, labor at my trade, take care of this and take care of that, do this and endure that, endure this and endure that, and whatever else of bitterness and drudgery married life involves? What? Should I make such a prisoner of myself? Oh, you poor wretched fellow, have you taken a wife? Fee, fee upon such wretchedness and bitterness. It is better to remain free and lead a peaceful, carefree life. I will become a priest. <laughs> Luther's anti, right? He goes on then, he goes on, the flip side of that, he goes on to encourage those who are married, to encourage those who work in the world. He praises the woman who gives birth or who cares for his home, right? Saying that, that it's through our vocations precisely that we are, love our neighbor, right? That, that's the great irony he sees, that monks claim to be um, f following God, but they're actually fleeing from what the, their neighbor, Right? And it's, it's precisely by loving those that we are around that we serve God most faithfully. So he praises the woman who gives birth, cares for her home. And he says of the involved dad in a quote that I just love, right? When a father goes ahead and washes dishes or performs some other mean task for his child and someone ridicules him as an effeminate fool, know that God, with all his angels and creatures, is smiling. Okay? It's precisely, according to Luther, by being a faithful, loving, and generous person in one's particular state of life that we truly respond to the call to be holy. Okay? By overturning that centuries-old conviction that the life of monastic withdrawal marked the holiest way of life, Luther launched, really, nothing less than a spiritual revolution, opening the door to what the Canadian philosopher Charles Taylor calls the affirmation of ordinary life which in many ways has become a defining characteristic of the modern West. The, this affirmation that comes out of the Reformation, this affirmation of ordinary life, right? Whenever we roll our eyes at Hollywood celebrities, okay, or demand that our politicians be plain spoken or drive pickup trucks, right? <laughs> whenever we rail against big banks, whenever we read customer reviews on Amazon.com, in many ways we're living out Luther's legacy, right? Affirming that it's the ordinary, not the elite, uh, that's, that's authentic, that's real, that's where it's at, that's true and trustworthy, this affirmation of ordinary life. So it's, it's, that's, that's a bigger conversation. I'm interested in the way in which he radically broadened the notion of vocation, right? Applying it to our jobs and our work, wherever we are. Every work is a calling from God.
It's a marvelous vision that was lost in later Protestant reflection, unfortunately. Because as the concept of vocation passes from Luther through John Calvin to the English Puritans, we see a noticeable shift. Luther talked about vocation in terms of one state of life. John Calvin emphasized more the idea of productive labor. And the Puritans just run crazy with this notion of work. Okay? So you see a shift from thinking about vocation as faithfulness within one's work to faithfulness through one's work to faithfulness to one's work. Okay? And the Protestant work ethic is born. Okay. The great irony uh, is that Luther's attempt to highlight the sacredness of work leads to a secularization of the notion of vocation. And we get to the point where we can quite comfortably talk about vocation without ever mentioning God, right? as in the guys who went off to the vocational program or voc ed. Okay. So in some ways, my, the common usage of that word vocation that I grew up with a kid can be traced back to these two historical trajectories, one Catholic and the other Protestant. Okay, that's a little bit of the background. Now, we all know, and in some ways, a wild tangent. <laughs> um, in some ways, uh, we all know the way in which uh, Catholics responded to this widening of vocation. In reaction to Luther's expansion of the language, Catholics hardened their narrow interpretation. Okay? It becomes even more associated with uh, ordained life, religious life. It's a narrowing. There are plenty of spiritual movements uh, in the early modern period that resist this monopolization of holiness. People like Francis de Sales and others who affirm a spirituality of God calling each of us. But in our official theology, vocation is reserved to what comes to be called ecclesiastical and religious vocations. The possibility for real holiness in marriage is always there, but it's seen as rather extraordinary or compromised. Okay. They're lay saints, but they all seem to live decidedly monastic lives. In other words, that lay people can aspire to sanctity by trying to live like monks. Um, and, and that usually their holiness comes um, despite their life in the world, not as Luther saw it, through one's life in the world. Am I making sense so far? Do you have any, any questions or comments you want to make it? At this point, I'm talking a lot. I mean, there'll be, there'll be time for a more extended Q&A at the end, but so far, are we doing OK? Should I proceed? OK. Excuse me. Do yes. Do you want to, 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 to mention again, or say again, uh, the conclusion of Luther, because I'm, and what we are living now, uh, because you mentioned that Luther began to say that the lay we have a vocation, too. Yes. But what, what could be his mistake to, to say in a certain way, what, in his assumption? Uh, yes, I'll see if I can respond to that. It's helpful, because uh, it keeps me before I kind of move on to other things. Um, one point I made is that Luther had a kind of a genuine spiritual insight. He wanted to kind of affirm that before God, uh, we are free through faith, OK? Um, and, and monks, he would say, and, and I think he's unfair to the, the monastic tradition, the broader, deeper, richer monastic tradition. He's, he's, you know, you can critique the abuses, but he uses it to cr critique the whole thing. The, um, the, uh, what he wants to say is that, um, that we ought to be free before God thanks to the gift of grace and faith. Monks uh, bind themselves. By, by trying to make their works in the monastery, okay? And, and, and instead, we should be thinking of ourselves as free before God through faith, but as bound to our neighbor in love, okay? Monks reverse that. They bind themselves to God and free themselves from their neighbor. So that's sort of his critique. And then I, I made the further point that, that there's a kind of a devolution. And, and I, this is not uh, my original point. This is primarily Protestant scholars who point this out, the kind of devolution of the Protestant doctrine of vocation, that it becomes secularized and, and too closely associated with the oh-so-ambiguous world of work. We, 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 it's easy to transfer. Every, tra to transform any work into a call, to, call, to think any work can be a calling and to sort of rationalize whatever it is we're already doing anyway. They, they kind of see that. Um, another point that I would point out, um, and, and this will, will sort of lead into um, how I kind of want to say the Catholics come around at Vatican II, that um, 
one of Luther's tendencies is to, is to always be thinking oppositionally. And so um, he lifts up the priesthood of the faithful by putting down the priesthood of the ordained. He lifts up the vocation of the laity by putting down the vocation of the monk. I think what Vatican II tries to do is lift up all of these vocations as different and complementary ways. Okay. Um, and that, but that's, that's really sort of where I was heading. But before I, yes. Hey. Makes me Judy. Think of, uh, your point makes me think of an interview that I saw around the, um, uh, the economic collapse where one man, I remember now, who, who had made obscene amounts of money said in the interview that when he was making this money, he felt that he was being blessed by God. Lloyd Blankenfeld. <laughs> <laughs> it was, I think it was actually somebody that was associated with um, uh, the, the pyramid guy. Uh, but, okay. you know, the secularization of, he said with all seriousness, right. that God was blessing him when he saw himself making just obscene amounts of money. Yeah. That God was blessing him in his family. Yeah. But you can see the sort of gradual sl slide down the slope because you start by saying, Luther's saying, look, don't uh, abdicate yourself from your, the, the responsibilities you have to care and love and, 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 and those around you. You know, you, you can't abandon your family to go live off as a peaceful and carefree life in the monastery and so on. You have to serve, and, and that's precisely where we're called to love. And then it's really kind of John Calvin who, who then sort of talks about um, um, well, there's also a way in which, yes, you have to kind of concretely show acts of love in that realm. But John Calvin also, also said, well, God's, in God's all inclusive, encompassing wisdom and divine providence has placed us in this particular place so that we can serve others through what we do. So, in other words, by, and this is actually, you know, there. Uh, 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 hints of this in Luther too, who will say, by milking the cow, um, the the uh, uh, the milk uh, um, through the milkmaid, God milks the cow, and so produces the butter, and so feeds the child. So in Calvin's kind of vision, it's by contributing your work, whatever it's doing, is contributing to building up the social order, and that kind of makes us, helps others indirectly. Okay, so. So all the, you know, and, and so you kind of, that evolves to thinking, right, that trading in um, um, derivatives or, um, uh, you know, in, engaging in, in any kind of activity then is a, is a divine calling. And in some ways, you can see sort of the point that there's a way in which we all contribute to society. But in other ways, Protestant theologians have pointed out there's a deep amb ambiguity there, too. Um, yeah. Yes. Did you hear the question? What, what's, the question was, what, what do I think is be behind this persistence in the tradition to assuming that a life of withdrawal and apartedness um, from the world uh, is the, the higher life? Um, that it's a very, I mean, excellent question, complicated answer. I think it has something to do with um, uh, uh, forces that predate Christianity, that in some ways, uh, there's a, a kind of a persistent dualism in Greek thought that tends to think spiritual good, worldly bad. And you see that in some of the earliest Christian authors who are influenced by uh, uh, Platonism, for example, that kind of sees that, um, that tends to want to uh, equate anything that is uh, not the pure mind of intellectual integrity or spiritual reality as kind of better, higher, holier, and, and things that kind of get you messed up in the world as, as less. Yeah, yeah. I think that there's also deep, um, uh, uh, part of what flows out of that dualism is a deep suspicion towards sexuality um, and, and the way in which that 
contrary to much of the kind of biblical <laughs> conception of, of sexuality, that that really has a powerful influence and a hold, and, and, and leads, frankly, to um, the uh, uh, um, uh, denigration of marriage, the married life, or, or, or the view of married life as a concession. Um, so it's, it's, there's a lot of layers to that. Also, I think we like experts who take care of things for us, and a lot of, <laughs> a, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of religions work that way. You have people, you you have uh, experts, and, and various religions have the, you know, you have the monks or the clergy, the priests, the priestesses, who handle handle God for us, and and and, and it's easier. Um, in some ways, that, that's what really, I think, the second millennium, when you think about the Reformation, when you think of various reforming movements in the late Middle Ages, um, it's not just about critiquing, um, it's reform of head and members, it's not just a, about critiquing abuses in the hierarchy or the, 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 the immorality of the Pap Vatican and you know, all this kind of that. Another big piece of behind all of that is this demand um, for everybody to live a full Christian life. That, that's, in some, that's what Taylor is talking about with this reform movement, what, what in some ways Luther is about, um, that everybody can be a 100% disciple. And that has a powerful kind of effect on Western thinking and culture um, that calls all of us to... Uh, uh, in fact, Taylor is very interesting. He says, you can trace all this. One, one place you can trace that back to is uh, 1215, um, the Fourth Lateran Council. Which, among other things, or kind of reforming council of religions, which, among other things, mandated yearly auricular confession. That once a year, the council said, um, Catholics have to go to confession in order to receive Eucharist. Well, in doing that, what the, what the bishops were saying is that everybody, through something that they can do, can aspire to something like the holiness of the saints. Um, that's a reforming move. That's trying to lift the bar for everybody. And that's, that's the flip side of, of, Ron, of, 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 of Luther's critique of the, the monasteries calling everybody to live a, a fuller life. Vatican II, I think, in some ways, uh, is uh, the Roman Catholic Church's embrace of reform in trying to call all the baptized to the fullness of holiness. Okay? But it, 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 it had to work through this bias that we've talked about already, um, in which... Um, uh, life in the world and the lay life was seen as a compromise uh, or was seen as an obstacle or a, a millstone or a burden to the life of holiness. And it's a bias within the, despite the, as I said earlier, despite the kind of, kind of remarkable voices over the course of the modern period calling for, uh, that, that, uh, calling all believers to holiness and all the rest uh, by becoming little monks or something in your own house or family or whatever. The bias is really over, only overcome in the 20th century with the emergence of the theology of the laity that led up to the Second Vatican Council. On the eve of Vatican II, everybody knew that the council had to say something about the laity. That really wasn't very controversial um, uh, um, at all. Although, I have to tell a story. Um, and, um, when I was writing my dissertation at the University of Notre Dame, um, I, I had uh, a, a study closet um, in the Hesburgh Library, right? That, I don't know, 13 story, I'm talking about Boston College, talking about Touchdown Jesus, right? It's got an enormous mural of, the, of, uh, of Jesus Christ, the word of, word of God, the word of life, facing the north end zone of Notre Dame Stadium. <laughs> so, Touchdown Jesus. But as I was writing my dissertation, I had a, a, a study carol that was beautiful, it was wonderful. It was on the 12th floor, um, had a, a view of the, um, of all of campus, and it was one floor below Father Ted Hesburgh, the retired, long-time, very consequential president of, of Notre Dame. And so everyone's, and he was retired, but active, and was going, would go into the office often. And he, uh, so I'd often get, on, get I'd be on the elevator with him. And um, Father Hesburgh was wonderful. He would always uh, talk to students, and he would, you know, always ask the same question. So what are you studying today? And they would tell him. And, he would say something like, they would say, oh, I'm working on physics. And he said, oh, I don't know much about physics. Except for that time I spent on the uh, President's Atomic Energy Commission. And, <laughs> and, or, or history. So, well, you're, we're, what are you studying the civil rights movement? Well, I marched with Martin Luther King. And, um, very uh, uh, wonderful person. So um, I had the same conversation with Father Hesburgh three times on the elevator. He asked me what I was studying. I said, well, I'm working on my dissertation in theology. He said, well, what's your dissertation? I said, well, I'm writing on 
lay ministry, the theology of the laity, lay ministry. And he stopped and looked at me and he said, I wrote my dissertation on the theology of the laity. Now, it's true. I mean, Father Hesburgh is in the Guinness Book of World's Records for the most honorary doctorates ever received by a human, a human being. Um, but his first doctorate, the one that he, uh, he, he produced uh, as a student, was on Catholic action, or the theology of the laity prior to Vatican II. So I would say, I know, Father, I've read your dissertation. It's very helpful. And he said, well, you know, it was very controversial in those days. This was in, he wrote it in the 40s. So it's very controversial, you know, talking about lay empowerment in the 1940s. This is very controversial in those days. They told me not to write it, but I went ahead and wrote it. And when I finished it, I got a letter from Rome asking for two copies. <laughs> and I was very nervous, but I sent them off and never heard anything back about it. And Pius XII died and they elected Pope John XXIII and he turned, called an ecumenical council. And what do you know? One of the topics they took up was the laity. And I'll never forget reading the document on the laity after the council was over and thinking, they stole all my material. <laughs> so, so in the States, the, the, my, the, talking about theology of the laity might have been controversial and so on. But in Europe, it, there was a lot going on. Very, it, there was a flush, a rush of lay activism and activity following the Second World War. Um, it was called at the time Catholic Action, which were these organized groups of, of, of lay people. Um, make a contribution. Everybody saw this as a positive thing. You had popes, one pope after another, Pius XI, Pius XII, affirming Catholic action, calling for a greater role for the laity, and so on and so forth. People, when the council came, wanted to affirm the laity um, at the pastoral level, but the theologians who were helping prepare for Vatican II also wanted to affirm it at the theological level. Okay? And one of the things that they realized, theologians like Eve Congar, Edward Skilex, and others, these kind of giants, theological giants at the council, is they re began to recognize the real limitations of the way in which the laity were presented in official church teaching. What they saw is that, basic, that, la that laity were described in basically negative terms, right? who they weren't, the clergy, and what they couldn't do lead, sanctify, et cetera, and so on. That, that was, and I kind of sometimes challenge my students, think about the word laity, layperson, right? How do you, I mean, another story from my dissertation, dissertation was the, this friend of mine in the business school who couldn't make heads or tails out of my attempt to write a dissertation on professional forms of lay ministry. She said, how do you have a lay professional? Because for her, a lay person was someone, a non-professional someone outside the area of expertise. And I challenge my students sometimes, can you define layperson without using the word not? It's basically a negative term. And, and theologically, that's how it's functioned. Um, at the council, actually, there's a famous story of Bishop Stefan Laszlo at Austria, from Austria, who during the debate on the document on the, lay, on the chapter on the laity got up and said, well, when I was pre preparing for this talk, I wanted to do my research and I went and uh, looked up um, uh, the word term laity in the uh, Kirchhoffian Lechikon, one of these uh, famous German encyclopedia sets that, you know, is kind of huge, multi volume set with enormous German esque articles on every topic imaginable. And he said, I looked up the word laity, and do you know what I found? See clergy. <laughs> right? Kind of a glimpse into the idea. There was no positive treatment of it. One last story from my graduate school days. When I was writing my dissertation, talking to Father Hesburgh, arguing with my uh, business school friend, um, I was working, typing away on this old computer whose spell checker kept trying to change the word laity to leper. <laughs> right? So that's a negative, another view of a negative theology of the laity. The theologians preparing for Vatican II wanted a more positive treatment, and the key they discovered was to talk about the world in a more positive way. That the world is created world, made good by loving God, is not this dangerous place to avoid, but precisely the place that Christ came to transform. So the laity's place in the world is the positive context within which they respond to Christ and live out the mission of the church. In some ways, saying what Luther said, but in a very different way. Um, Vatican II then uh, talks about the universal call to holiness that touches all discipleships, disciples. 
and that it is not just the religious or the clergy who are called, the laity too are called, and their distinctive vocation, according to Lumen Gentium, the Vatican II's document on the church, their distinctive vocation is to transform the secular world in the light of Christ. And so that, I think, has set up what is, the, what is basically the official Catholic consensus on vocation, which is, has two parts, I think. <clears throat> All of the baptized are called to holiness, the universal call to holiness, and this universal call takes shape in various vocations. Okay? And we, our ecclesiastical documents, magisterial documents since the council, tend to use the word vocation in a more flexible ways. It's used in a variety and plurality of different ways. Pope bon John Paul II said that of these various ways in which the universal call of holiness is lived out, he called three vocations as paradigmatic. And this is from his document on consecrated life. Ordained ministry, consecrated life, and the lay life. That for the Pope, those are the paradigmatic. Priest, religious, and laity are the three ways in which this holiness is lived out. Comments or questions on that? I, um, or, no? Okay. Um, that was sort of my quick historical overview, um, which brings me to kind of my, the third and last point I want to make, which really sort of starts with a, um, oh, a reservation uh, with this official Catholic consensus. Um, a kind of a small complaint that I would register. <clears throat> and it's this. Um, I really appreciate and welcome the broadening of the notion of vocation that has occurred at Vatican II and since Vatican II in our uh, Catholic tradition. But I still feel sometimes that it tends a little bit too much to approach the whole thing in a deductive way. Right? That tends to lay out these various states of life as, uh, as these kinds of molds into which we're expected to fit. And so the whole question of vocational discernment becomes a question of fit. Do I fit into marriage? Do I fit the single life? Do I fit into a particular ministry or a particular career? What some of our, that's the, how theology has set it up for us at, at present. But if we turn from theologians to our saints, <laughs> with some of our greatest saints in our tradition, people like Ignatius of Loyola, Francis de Sales, Teresa of Lisieux, what we see in them is that they tend to approach the whole question of discernment and discerning of vocation not deductively, but inductively. Ignatius, for example, believed that people don't usually march through theory towards a vocation. For Ignatius, we discover our call in the face of a concrete choice, a personal decision, the everyday living out of life. For most people, it's not the abstract ideal of marriage, but love for this specific person that leads them to embrace this commitment. It is a concrete decision to serve that draws most people into ministry. In other words, we don't usually move from some general and abstract universal call towards our personal vocation. It's usually from our personal vocation that we discover our unique way of living out the universal call to holiness. And so it's our, what I call our personal vocation that is the starting point and the more helpful entry point, I think, for reclaiming what I said, a more personally meaningful and pastorally relevant notion of call in a culture of choice. And we forget that. And I think it's too bad that we forget that in our Catholic conversations about vocation because our personal vocation is one of the most important things we ought to be thinking about. It's nothing less than thinking about how I'm going to take part in God's plan for me. It ultimately comes down to the question, who am I? And how does that understanding of self help us to find our unique purpose in life? Or, to quote the poet Mary Oliver, what am I to do with my one wild and precious life? Right? That's the vocational question. What am I to do with my one wild and precious life? The answer to that question is our personal vocation. And all of this touches on the realm of discernment, 
um, which is an incredibly large, rich, and difficult area uh, to talk about. And I imagine folks in this room have lived this process in much deeper ways than I can talk about at all. And I've read a lot about it. And I think that all that I can do um, is to maybe just offer up one theological principle that it seems to me every healthy theology and spirituality of discernment lifts up. And that is, namely, that the God who made us saves us. That the God who made us saves us. <clears throat> One of the earliest heresies Christianity faced was that promoted by, the guy, by a guy by the name of Marcion in the second century. Marcion believed when he read the Hebrew Bible and then the Christian New Testament, he couldn't believe that the God described in the, in the, in the Old Testament was the same God as the God de de described in the New Testament. Right? One seemed so strong on justice and wrath, the other so much about mercy and love. And so his argument was that there were, in fact, two gods. And he was motivated by Greek dualism of his day, that the only way you can explain this awful earth is that it was made by an awful god. And we need some other god to save us from this awful earth. Okay? So he basically argued for two gods, the, the evil creator god, the good saving god of Jesus. Chuck the Hebrew Bible, Old Testament, most of the New Testament, except those parts that agreed with him, um, and uh, 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 force the church to do a couple of things, not in any systematic, organized way. But, uh, but then gradually, the church came to reject Marcion's view. And in doing so, it maintained the Hebrew Bible as sacred scripture, affirmed Christianity's continuity with the covenant, ma covenant made with Israel, and made a very important claim about the created world, namely that the created world, too, was made good by a loving God. Right? And the story of Christ is not a story of rejection of the world or rejection of us. The story of Christ is a story of, of God coming to bring the world and to bring us to the perfection intended from the beginning. St. Thomas Aquinas, great medieval theologian, one of the greatest, uh, uh, has a line where she says, grace perfects nature. Okay? Not in the sense of fixing, grace, fixing something that's broken, but grace bringing nature to its full destiny. That for Thomas, God's saving plan is not a radical reversal of God's original plan in making us. To be saved, we reject sin, but we don't need to reject who we are. To be holy, we don't need to deny our per personality. And so we ought to be, uh, right? it seems to me, most wise people talking about discernment and leading others through it, we need to realize that we can learn a lot about what God wants for us if we pay attention to who we are, the way we're made, what we bring, our personality, our interests, our abilities. Uh, almost every semester, I try and find some way to have my students read a small, short little essay by Thomas Merton called Things in Their Identity. It's from his collection, Seeds of Contemplation. And I tell them, I'm sorry to ruin it all for you, but you are now reading the best theological essay in the English language, and it will all be downhill from here. <laughs> Thomas Merton's little essay, Things in Their Identity, begins with the line, a tree gives glory to God, first of all, by being a tree. And he goes on. The forms and individual characters of living and growing things, and of inanimate things, and of animals and flowers and all nature, constitute their holiness in the sight of God. Their inscape is their sanctity. The special clumsy beauty of this particular cult on this April day in this field under these clouds is a holiness consecrated to God by his own art, and it declares the glory of God. The pale flowers of the dogwood outside this window are saints, the little yellow flowers that nobody notices on the edge of the road are saints looking up into the face of God. So Merton goes on in this essay to talk about God's special care for particularity, special care for the way in which each unique thing is itself and is itself. He says, this leaf has its own texture and its own pattern of veins and its own holy shape. And the bass and trout hiding in the deep pools of the river are canonized by their beauty and their strength. But the great gashed half-naked mountain is another of God's saints. There is no other like it. 
It is alone in its own character. Nothing else in the world ever did or ever will imitate God in quite the same way, and that is its sanctity. All reminds me of a scene from um, a movie from a few years back, uh, um, Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, it was old Kevin Costner movie. Does anybody remember that? Or? It's an awful movie. Um, it's <laughs> just saccharine in its sentimentality and all the rest. But there's a great scene in it in which Morgan Freeman, who plays a kind of a, 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 a Moor, a North African, who's brought by Robin Hood back to medieval England. There's a great scene in which Morgan Freeman uh, runs into this little English boy who's never seen a Moor before. And the little boy quite innocently asks him, why is your skin so dark? And Morgan Freeman replies in the only way, you know, in the way only Morgan Freeman can reply. He says, because God loves our wondrous diversity. Right? God loves our wondrous diversity. It's a great line. I mean, how true is that? How else do you explain this world in which we live, right? A world uh, full of, uh, of amoebas and alligators, uh, galaxies and coffee cake, Johann Sebastian Bach and Lady Gaga. <laughs> God loves our wondrous diversity. One of the best homilies I ever heard was uh, at uh, baccalaureate mass at my high school in Lake Leona, Michigan. It wasn't my baccalaureate. It was one of my um, sisters. And I don't know how they, if they, how they do baccalaureate, if they do them around here, but how it worked in my high school is it was, it was the Sunday mass, the 10 o'clock mass, the day of commencement at the parochial school. And so all the graduates would wear their cap and gowns, process in uh, at the beginning of Mass. They'd sit up in the front. They would do the readings and bring up the gifts and be active um, in, the, in the liturgy. Okay. So it came around time for the homily, and Father Charlie comes down from the altar, and he stands right in front of the graduates. And you know, they're all sitting there cocky as hell on the day of graduation with all of their family and friends sitting behind them beaming with pride. And, Father Charlie says, you know, what a great day today is. There is so much today to be proud of. There's so much to be excited about, so much to be happy for. But I feel it's my responsibility on this day to say to you graduates that your parents never wanted you. <laughs> your parents never wanted you. And he said, no. I imagine maybe they wanted a baby, or they wanted a boy, or they wanted the girl, but your parents never wanted you, right? Only God wanted you, okay? Only God wanted you, right? I've been spending the last 15 years trying to take that seriously. What does it mean to say that God wanted me, all right? Well, it begins by taking who I am seriously. Merton, in his essay, Merton continues, he says, <clears throat> for me, to be a saint means to be myself, okay? He wasn't saying that because he was a saintly monk living in Kentucky, a monastery in Kentucky. He was saying that's something we can all say. For me, to be a saint means to be myself. Therefore, the problem of sanctity and salvation is, in fact, the problem of finding out who I am and of discovering my true self. Trees and animals have no problem. God makes them what they are without consulting them, and they are perfectly satisfied. With us, it is different. God leaves us free to be whatever we like. We can be ourselves or not, as we please. But the problem is this. Since God alone possesses the secret of my identity, he alone can make me who I am, or rather, he alone can make me who I will be when I at last fully begin to be. Right? My vocation is not, not out there apart from me. My vocation is me. That's the point that he's trying to say. That's, that's the truth of an inductive approach to vocation, coming to discern that. Now, you will, I'm running out of time here, so we'll wrap this up. You will, I hope, notice a problem with this whole scenario. Right? And that is that I, you and I, I, often screw things up. Right? I confuse who God made me to be with who I want me to be. And that's the reality of sin. Dennis Doyle, who's a theologian at the University of Dayton, tells a story that I just love because it perfectly matches my own experience. When I was an undergrad in college, 
I had this profound experience, uh, an insight really, into our fundamental equality of all people in, before God as children of God. And I remember how it, it came over me. I was, it was, I was walking into the dining hall um, at lunch, and I was carrying my tray of food, and I remember looking up at the lunchroom, this huge, big, open room full of rows and rows of tables, you know, this kind of sea of, of my classmates and, and peers. And it just kind of washed over me at that moment. I thought, you know, in the eyes of God, I am no better than anyone here. That's how it came to me. In the eyes of God, I am no better than anyone here. It was a really deep insight that was almost immediately followed by a second insight, namely, that as one of the very few people who truly understood that I am no better than anybody else, I'm just slightly better than most people. Right? Right? That's the reality of sin, right? St. Augustine called it pride, right? Not pride in the sense of a healthy appreciation for one's gifts and abilities. By pride, Augustine meant that ever-present temptation to expect the universe to revolve around me, right? To set up myself through decisions and actions large and small over the course of a lifetime as master and commander of all that is. That's the reality of sin. That's what Merton calls the false self, right? That self that wants to exist outside the radius of God's will and God's love. The great paradox, the sad paradox, is that nothing and no one can exist outside the radius of God's will and love. And so sin is the way in which we strangely strive for an illusion, to become nothing, to exist where there can be no existence. And the best we can do, Merton says, is wrap ourselves up in our material possessions, our money, honors, experiences, pleasures. And he, his image is like an invisible body wrapping itself in bandages, all of which comes to an end in an em emptiness telling me that I made a mistake. Right? We can be ourselves or not as we please. So that's the problem with this whole scenario, that, that the world is full of examples of people not accepting their true selves. But we see that. We know it. We can tell. My uh, mentor at Notre Dame, Tom O'Mara, uh, used to say that, you know, it's safe to say that Don Corleone said no to friendship with Jesus. Right? <laughs> we, can, we see that. The Christian message, I think, is that this false self is a distraction, our way of clouding who we are and of complicating what ought to be easy, being a child of God being myself. And all of that alerts us to one of the great ironies of the Christian call, that following Jesus frees us. As disciples, we discover ourselves, our true selves, our unique, unfinished, and incredibly beautiful selves. As disciples, we learn to discern, coming to see, accept, and live out the simple truth that God wanted me. God wanted me. So thank you, friends.